Ethers, which contain two carbons linked to an oxygen via single bonds, are generally not very reactive. The one exception here are epoxides, also called oxiranes. These are cyclic ethers that contain a relatively strained three-membered ring that can open upon reaction of the epoxide. Now, just to talk a little bit about the structures of epoxides, the two carbons inside the three-membered ring are sp3 hybridized, that makes it an oxirane, and these are sometimes named as alkene oxides. So for example, the simplest epoxide is the oxide of ethylene, C2H4. I've got a CH2 here, CH2 here, and an oxygen. This is ethylene oxide. The strain that's built into the epoxide ring makes these compounds reactive, and it opens the door to nucleophilic substitution reactions because that, epo that uh, epoxide oxygen has the potential to act as a leaving group. That makes the two carbons in the epoxide ring relatively electrophilic. Nucleophiles can attack at these carbons and open the ring via electron flow like this. The bottom of this slide just shows two examples of epoxides in nature, two sex pheromones of the female gypsy moth and the American cockroach apparently include epoxides. Interesting, makes you wonder if those epoxide rings are integral to their mechanism of action. Hmm, who knows? All right, how do we make epoxides? Well, we already know how to do this from prior discussions of alkene additions. The simplest way conceptually to make an epoxide uses a per-carboxylic acid. This is a rather exotic reagent that in, uh, looks like sort of an exploded carboxylic acid. So we have a carboxyl group that's linked to a hydroxyl group through its oxygen. So there's an extra oxygen kind of shoved in here uh, relative to a carboxylic acid. And these deliver this extra oxygen in a syn manner to an alkene, forming an epoxide in a single step via syn addition of that extra oxygen in the per-carboxylic acid. And there are two per-carboxylic acids that are commonly used. There's MCPBA, metachloroperbenzoic acid, or per-acetic acid. And it's a stereospecific reaction, as we just mentioned. So if I start with, for example, these two methyl groups, cis and the starting alkene, the two methyl groups will remain cis in the product. Now, another approach for making epoxides also takes advantage of an alkene addition reaction, but involves two steps. In the first step, we do a halohydrin formation with an elemental halogen like Br2 and H2O, and that, that establishes this halohydrogen a hydrin with an OH and Br on adjacent carbons in an anti-relationship. This is actually the perfect setup for an intramolecular or internal SN2 reaction in which the oxygen is used as a nucleophile and bromide as a good leaving group. So at this point, we hit with a strong base, something like sodium hydride, Na plus H minus. The H minus deprotonates the hydroxyl group. We get an alkoxide and an intramolecular SN2 reaction to establish the second CO bond of the epoxide. As in the per acid method above, this is an overall syn method. Although the halo hydrogen formation is anti, the SN2 step occurs with inversion of configuration as usual, right? And so the epoxide oxygen will end up with um, two new bonds to the epoxide carbons on the same side of the original starting alkene. So these two approaches, by and large for our purposes, are interchangeable, but you may see both in Organic Chemistry 1. The ring strain built into epoxides means these are the only ethers that are susceptible to nucleophilic substitution reactions when neutral. We can put epoxides in acid to do nucleophilic substitutions, and we'll touch on that later, but the thing that really sets epoxides apart is that you can treat them with strong nucleophiles and get nucleophilic substitution reactions like this. And the basic idea in these reactions with strong nucleophiles is SN2 substitution. That is the name of the game. The nucleophile attacks at one of the epoxide carbons, and the CO bond breaks toward oxygen, opening the ring, and that relief of ring strain provides a driving force for these nucleophilic substitutions. So we can use, for example, alkoxides forming one alkoxy alcohols, uh, two alkoxy alcohols rather, cyanide, sulfides or uh, thiolates. We can use Grignard reagents, which contain a carbanion, or we can use lithium aluminum hydride, which is a source of anionic 
hydrogen. Without saying too much about the Grignard's lithium aluminum hydride, I'll just point out for now that RMGBR is essentially a carbanion. You'll learn a lot more about these reagents in organic chemistry too, but this is such a compelling way to make carbon-carbon bonds with this really anionic um, source of carbon that it's worth mentioning here. And lithium aluminum hydride is a source of nucleophilic hydrogen. We've seen hydride salts before, primarily as Bronsted bases, but the H's built into lithium aluminum hydride are actually nucleophilic and can be used, for example, to install an H adjacent to an alcohol group. And so overall here, what we get, if you look at all these products and see what they have in common, these are two substituted alcohols. They are alcohols that contain some functional group at the two position relative to the carbon that bears the hydroxy group. And this is a fantastic way to generate these structures from ultimately alkenes, right? You can imagine these two central carbons as coming from ethylene via epoxidation, followed by this nucleophilic ring opening reaction. Strong nucleophiles in combination with epoxides act through an SN2 mechanism, and so the regioselectivity and stereospecificity are entirely driven by what we already know about the SN2 mechanism, where it's very sensitive to steric effects, and so strong nucleophiles will react selectively at the less substituted epoxide carbon. It's less sterically hindered, so the nucleophile attacks there. And stereochemically uh, speaking, the reaction occurs with inversion of configuration at the electrophilic carbon. However, only one of the two epoxide carbons actually reacts. The carbon that does not react, if it's a stereocenter, its configuration is not affected by this ring opening reaction. So for example, here we have actually two stereocenters in the starting epoxide, right? This is a stereocenter and so is this, and the less substituted one is highlighted here in green. This is the carbon where nucleophilic attack will take place, and an inversion of configuration does occur there, and we see this in, in purple. The label also switches in this case, and so we go from an S stereocenter to an R stereocenter, assuming the nucleophile gets top priority in terms of Kahn and Gold Prelog priorities, but notice that the other stereocenters configuration is completely unaffected. It's really just a bystander in this reaction, right? It's not participating at all. This oxygen just kind of flops over here in the final product, and this carbon's just sort of along for the ride. So it starts R and it ends R, and there's no change in configuration at that carbon. Let's predict the products of a couple of reactions involving the combination of a strong nucleophile with an epoxide. And in both of these examples, we've got the two epoxide carbons with different substitution patterns. For example, here, we've got a fully substituted epoxide carbon here, and here we have an epoxide carbon with only one substituent. Cyanide is a strong nucleophile, so we know we're looking at an SN2 mechanism here, and cyanide is going to attack at the less substituted position as a result. This is going to generate an alkoxide intermediate that looks like this. Notice the inversion of configuration. And this is worth pausing and checking on your own that putting the cyanide on a wedge right here as I've drawn it does correspond to an inversion of configuration relative to the starting epoxide. Something that may be helpful is imagining rotating this group, this ethyl group, forward a little bit so that it's in the plane. That'll have the effect of pushing this bond back behind the screen, the epoxide oxygen back behind the screen, indicating that the nucleophile is going to come from above and the leaving group will stay behind. This corresponds to backside attack. And the final step of the mechanism, and this is the purpose of the water in step two, we're going to protonate that alkoxide oxygen and the resulting product is a neutral alcohol with the cyano group at the carbon adjacent to the hydroxyl group. Notice also here that the configuration of this stereocenter in blue did not change during the reaction. I took care to make sure that this configuration stayed the same in the product as it was in the starting material. In the second case here, we again have two distinct carbons, one with no substituents and one with one substituent. And we've got 
a fantastic nucleophile in SME minus, the methylthiolate anion. So we're going to treat with that, followed by water, just as a proton source. So we're in SN2 world with this great nucleophile, SME minus. It's going to react selectively at the less substituted position. And we end up with this alkoxide intermediate, and that gets protonated by water to form the product here, which has this sulfur group adjacent to the alcohol group. And notice here that because the electrophilic carbon was not a stereocenter, right, it's a CH2 group, there's no change in configuration in the product. This stereocenter still has the same configuration. It was just along for the ride, not directly involved in the reaction at all.